Um, and the other part that sort of like, because we're dealing with enslaved individuals here who in, in most cases by law are not allowed to learn how to read and write. Um, and who, I mean, how, how do you get to, to their voices? Mm. Um, how do you, in, in part, not just how do you get to their voices because it's other people who are saying things for them in some sure. cases. Um, yeah, and, and you know, any, anyone who, who researches African-American history understands that, that getting that authentic voice is really a great challenge. And, you know, going into this project, um, I really was only aware of one uh, slave narrative, and that was Bethany Veeney. So Bethany Veeney was uh, an enslaved woman from uh, Page County, Virginia, but she was out of the valley uh, and free living in uh, New England by the time the Civil War broke out. And I stumbled across um, this one uh, sli this one freedom narrative published in 1872, uh, written by a formerly enslaved uh, man from Frederick County, Virginia. So that's the northern part of the valley where Shenandoah University is. Uh, his name was John Quincy Adams. And John Quincy Adams, he um, became a very prominent figure in Harrisburg society after the war. Uh, became a, a leader for equality within that community, but he and his family um, they left when they left Frederick County, Virginia, uh, in uh, 1862 during a, a brief presence of General John Geary's forces um, in Winchester. And you know, so that's that's one of these authentic voices uh, that that courses throughout, particularly the early part of the book, because one of the one of the arguments, as I said, is that. Um, you know, I heard it all the time, and, and I've, I've lived in the Valley since 1997, and one of the things I would always hear is, well, slaves here are treated better, mm. um, <laughs> and, that's, and that's bothersome, you know, to me, because that, that shows just a complete lack of awareness that the thing itself, I mean, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote that, it is the thing itself that is the problem that is inhumane, and um, John Quincy Adams reflects on this. Um, in this in this freedom narrative. And, you know, he, he basically said that, you know, materially, we didn't really want for anything. Um, you know, we were we were properly fed and cared for and all those types of things. And, and again, I argue in the book, basically, what enslavers are doing is they're protecting their investment. Um, but he he has this very powerful moment where he talks about how um, when, whenever there would be visitors at his enslaver's home, uh, the, the woman, it was the, the Calamese family of Frederick County, uh, the mistress of the household, she would come out and show people, you know, and she would put the hand on the head of an enslaved child or whatever the case might be. And she would say, well, here's $1,500 and here's $2,000. Um, and it's just, you know, again, putting your, your property um, on display. So, John Quincy Adams's narrative, I, I was so happy to, uh, to discover that. But then there were some other things as well, um, quite honestly, that I was surprised that other historians hadn't used before. Uh, so, you know, one of the, the staples for any Civil War historian um, are regimental histories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going through regimental histories, um, there are these there are these accounts and, and basically they're they're almost like oral history interviews. Uh, so I think about Alonzo Quint, who was the chaplain of the Second Massachusetts Infantry. He writes extensively about his interactions with enslaved people and you know asking them questions about what they thought about the situation and how they feel and and all of these types of things. And um, so there's a lot that, that I was able to call from those regimental histories, a lot from you know, the National Tribune newspapers, soldiers' reminiscences, and those types of things. But one of the sources that was kind of like this, this, this grand moment, you're supposed to be quiet when you're research, you know, researching in archives, um, but looking at uh, Nathaniel P. Banks's papers. So, and again, this is kind of a shock to me that that individuals hadn't used this before, but within General Banks's papers um, at the Library of Congress, you have reports filed in late 61, early 62, where 
his soldiers at Harper's Ferry are recording uh, the names, the ages, physical descriptions of enslaved people from various valley communities who have run away. And also they're, those soldiers are asking them things. You know, why did you run away? What was it like? Um, is there any information you can provide? And so, you know, looking at that little time frame, you know, late 61 into the early months of 62, basically into, you know, mid to late March, you know, we're able to get identities of enslaved people. Uh, we're able to get names of enslavers. Uh, we're able to, you know, hear through the interviews that those soldiers at Harper's Ferry conducted, um, you know, the brutality of slavery in the Valley, that, that they're not treated well. Um, you know, they're being threatened all the time with, with physical violence or being sold. Um, and also one of the other things that, that really struck me is not only the testimony about their experience, but the information they provided. So, you know, when you look at a community like Winchester, it is, it is encircled by different earthwork fortifications throughout the course of the conflict. And so you have these enslaved people, particularly those who are coming from um, the area around Winchester, they're revealing, you know, the strength of, of Confederate defenses, what types of cannon they have in there, what sort of obstacles they're erecting in front. And all this is really important information for General Banks as, as he's moving toward Winchester uh, in March of 1862. So that was really um, kind of shocking that that other historians didn't tap didn't tap that resource. I'm glad that they didn't. Um, but also, you know, again, kind of going back to the what was really one of the the major creative forces behind this book book and the, and the driving forces behind it is the Freedmen's Bureau Papers. And again, you know, Ed Ayers did a did a great job in his both of his books. Um, looking at those records specifically for Augusta County. But I mean, we're talking literally tens of thousands of pages of documents for all of the other counties in the Shenandoah Valley right. that, that have been left untouched. Um, and so I, I, was, I was, you know, I, I think one of the reasons I delayed this book early on in my career was that trepidation of, I know some of the story, but is there going to be enough of that voice mm -hmm. of enslaved people where I could tell uh, as complete a story as possible mm -hmm. at this point? And so, yeah, it was it was uh, really kind of revealing, you know, wondering why other historians kind of ignored what's in regimentals and didn't bring those in. But then, you know, again, the, the Banks papers looking at uh, Freedmen's Bureau papers, there's also, you know, these wonderful collections at the Library of Virginia that enumerate um, slave property lost in 1862. And this was all collected for tax purposes and enslaved people fleeing away. So we have, you know, we know if they're, they're fleeing in, in, you know, when General Banks is moving south or when General Fremont comes over from the, the Western part of Virginia. So yeah, I was able to, I, I think as best as possible to, to lend some, some degree of, of authenticity to, to the voice of, of the enslaved people and the, and the reality of the obstacles they confronted. Yeah, it, it's fascinating to kind of think of like the different avenues that you go through and sometimes the sort of accidental find in, in the mm -hmm. archive, right?